we'll start in First Corinthians three tonight. First Corinthians three, and really been building and kind of laying some of the topics we're going to dive into in uh, on this series we've been doing called uh, the New Cart Church. We're using the illustration there in the Old Testament. They, um, when the Philistines got rid of the ark uh, because it wasn't playing nice with their God, uh, they were storing the ark of the covenant in the temple of Dagon, and every time they came in to check on it, their God kept falling over, and then eventually the their uh, Dagon's head fell off and his hands fell off, and we thought this is not good. On top of that, they were experiencing plagues, and so. Uh, so they decided, you know what, if we send this out of our city and it goes back to uh, Israel, then we'll know that God was the one sending these plagues and he'll, he'll stay the plagues. It's just some superstition that came up with on their own, but that did happen. And so what they did was they constructed a cart and uh, had it pulled by a, a couple of milk cows and sent it on back. And, uh, and sure enough, it comes back to Israel. So when it comes in, the first town that it comes to, they got all excited seeing this ark, by the way. It's been gone for 70 years at this point. And they decide to look inside and check it out, and they got hit with plagues. Uh, and by the way, God's people should have known better. The Philistines, I, I, in this sense, I think would get a pass, right? They're able to touch it and, and that kind of stuff because they didn't know better. But God's people knew better. They knew how to, how to treat the ark. And, uh, and so... Eventually, long story short, David gets word that uh, it's come back. He goes and he sees uh, the condition and he sees how it was brought to them. And so what does he do? He copies the Philistines. He uh, constructs a new cart and uh, has it uh, pulled by some milk cows and they, they put it on there. And, uh, and as it's going along, it starts to topple and it starts to wobble. And, and, uh, and they reach out to stabilize the thing and another person's dead. And, uh, and so they, 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 they set it up uh, there for a while and... And um, uh, down the road, uh, it's brought to David's attention somehow that, uh, that, wait a minute, we were doing this thing wrong. That the ark should be carried on the, on the shoulders of the holy men, the, 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 the priests, the ones that were designated for the task. And, and um, uh, no one's to touch this thing. No one's to definitely, look in, definitely not supposed to look inside. And so they go back and they try again, this time doing it the right way. And, uh, and it worked. And, uh, and they basically have a parade all the way back to Jerusalem where the ark belongs. And that's where we find the passage where David is seen dancing in the street. He's just overcome with joy and excitement to have the ark returned. And, uh, and we're using that as an illustration that when we're copying the world, when we're copying the Philistines that try to get God's presence into our churches, God uh, into our congregation, so to speak, um, then all, all it's doing is bringing death into the camp. And we're seeing that in, uh, in, in all over the world all around us. And Christianity is, is we're seeing, you know, what's going on on MTV and what's going on uh, in the latest trends, what's going on in, in uh, you know, on, on social media and TikTok and, and all those things. And, and we're copying all the latest trends, thinking this is going to bring some excitement, this is going to bring some life. And it may seem like it for a temporary time, but what's end, what ends up happening, the fruit of that is going to be spiritual death. Jesus, writing to one of the seven churches in Revelation, says to, to one of the churches, he says, you have a name that says life, but, but you're death. Your, your church is dead. It's dying. And that's where it says, strengthen the things that remain, the things that aren't quite dead, the things that have not quite failed. And he says, he says let's come back to that uh, before you could die completely. And I think that's going on all around us in, in many churches today. We start off the series looking at some statistics. And how there are more mega churches and giga churches in America than any other time in history. And yet, most would agree that America, morally speaking, is in a free fall. And things are falling apart. That's right. We're seeing it almost daily in the news. Uh, some more, another shocking thing that we think we would never see this even in secular society 50 years ago. And today, uh, I'd say Christianity is under attack in America like never before. Uh, the, the politicians are painting um, conservative Christians as, as extremists, as terrorists. You keep hearing this term, um, Christian nationalism. How many of you heard that in recent days? Okay. What they're trying to do is trying to use some shocking language to try to make it look like these are where Christians are taking things. And by the way, do you know who they're labeling as Christian nationalists, which is this extremist kind of a thinking? 
anyone that has this idea that our rights don't come from government but God. If that's the mark, if that's where we're putting that thing, we're in trouble. By the way, if that's what a Christian national is, sign me up. Okay, That's what our founders agreed on. That's what's made America so blessed of God all these years, recognizing that, 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 that God indeed rules in the kingdoms of men. All right, so that's some of the foundational things we've looked at. We're going to start zeroing in a little bit as we consider the Lord's church, and, uh, and, and do we have the right foundation? The right foundation. I decided to go through this series and try to unpack some of these, uh, these topics this year as our focus this year has been how firm a foundation. The Bible tells us if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's nothing else to stand on. If the foundations are falling apart, what, 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 what's left, folks? What can the righteous do? And let me just say this. The Lord has not called us home yet. He's not called us home yet. So that means there's more to fight. And I think, I think if we're not careful, we have some Christians that have some convictions and, and, uh, and, and see what's going on. And I think sometimes they're kind of giving up, the, thrown in the towel, and they're thinking, uh, you know, if we just hold out a little bit longer, surely the Lord's coming soon. But folks, He's left us here as soldiers to occupy till He comes. That's not surrender. That's not giving up. We're to occupy. We're to take, uh, take the ground that we have and, and to hold, hold the fort. And, and the idea is even to advance on the enemy. And so, so we have to ask ourselves, you know, how are we doing with this thing? Are we just kind of, you know, let's board up the windows and let's hunker down and we're just kind of wait for Armageddon? Or are we going to do what he has called us to do, for we are more than conquerors? I mean, you look, at, you look at some of the promises, so much in the passages of Scripture, we say, are we doing what God's called us to do? And so, so if some of you who haven't been here for the whole series, this, this, that's a brief overview, very brief. But uh, when we look at this thought of having the right foundation, look at 1 Corinthians uh, 3 and uh, verse number 11. We're going to come back to this passage in a couple of weeks um, on Sunday mornings. But, uh, but notice what it says there in uh, 1 Corinthians 3. Look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, in other words, there is one sure foundation, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, there's no other foundation. As we sang uh, the solid rock this morning, all other ground is what? Sinking sand. And so, it's considered what does this look like to have Christ as the foundation? And I think there's a lot of churches out there that would say Christ is the foundation, but as we pull back the curtain a little, as what we're going to do tonight, I think we may find there is a shaky foundation there that is actually not Christ. And, uh, and so hopefully uh, this will be a help to us. Let's have a word of prayer and ask God's help this evening. Father, we do ask for your help. May we be a church, Lord, that truly has the right foundation. I'm thankful, Lord, as you started this church, as you led us to even choose the name Cornerstone Baptist Church, as, as we are built upon Christ, our chief cornerstone, that we, that we aim, we desire to have that right foundation. And Father, if we ever depart from that foundation, then we've forfeited our right to exist as a church. So Lord, help us to understand what that is. And tonight, as we unpack some of these passages, Lord, I pray that you deepen a conviction in our own hearts on this foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. We ask for your help now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew 6, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit more in a second. Uh, uh, in John 1, 14, the Bible says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We understand that Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. And, and, and let me say this. God, Jesus would never do anything contrary to the Father's will. Hebrews 10, 9. Uh, says that he always did the will of the Father. Jesus would never do anything contrary to the will of God. God God's will is revealed through His Word. A church that is built by Jesus Christ will be in accordance to His Word. You'll never find the will of God apart from the Word of God. Now, let me just stop there. Something as simple as that concept alone would drastically change the life of many Christians today. We say, oh, yeah, of course. 
You, are, you emphasize that all the time, that, that the will of God is connected to the word of God, that, 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 God, uh, the, 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 that God would never violate his word. The spirit of God, the, the, the Holy Spirit would never guide us contrary to the word of God. They're always going to be in conjunction. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so, uh, so it seems kind of um, uh, obvious to us, but let me just tell you, there are many people out there that are trying to discern God's will apart from His Word. And they would see no problem with it. Based on feelings, based on emotion, based on uh, others around them, based on circumstances. But God's not going to show us His will through His Word. So we can identify, or so, so here, here's the question, can we identify what is a church that Jesus established and what it is not? As we look to the Word of God, can we identify, you know, because let, let, let's be honest here, there are, uh, there are churches that are not the Lord's church. In fact, Jesus used this term in Revelation. They're, they're of the synagogue of Satan. How'd you like that to be the description from the Lord of your church? The synagogue of Satan? But that was probably a building that had a sign that says church on it. Synagogue of Satan. Mark it down. If there's a good church, there's a bad church. If there's a church that is that is doctrinally sound, there is a church that is heretical. But here's the question. Can we know which is which? Can we know what is what? Jesus said that he would build his church upon the rock. Now, let's go ahead and turn there to Matthew 16. I want you to see this. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. um, um, Jesus is having a discussion with his disciples here. And just to get the whole context here, let's go ahead and uh, start with um, verse number 13. Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, come back to life. Some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. That's a title, by the way. That's not Jesus' name. That's his title, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so some think that this is referring to Peter being the rock. Jesus would build his church upon a rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Some think that that rock is Peter. Of course, uh, uh, the Greek word for Peter here is petros. Petros, which uh, the uh, uh, the word rock, when he says upon this rock, I'll build my church, is, um, I'm sorry, uh, Peter is Petros. Petros, the, for rock, is Petros. Very close. Petros speaks of a piece of a rock that came from a bigger rock. Petros is the larger rock that the small rock came from. It's the boulder, if you would. So it's interesting that he uses two different words as he says, Thou art, thou art uh, uh, Petros. But upon this Petros, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This agrees with Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Was, Jesus gonna, was Peter going to be a part of it? Absolutely. But he is a part of this stone. He's a part of the foundation. He's a part of the stone, but there is a chief cornerstone. In fact, in, uh, in Revelation 21, it talks about the 12 apostles of the Lamb are part of the foundation there in that new Jerusalem. They all have their place. They all have their role. If the foundation is Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, together with the apostles and prophets, then Peter could not have been the rock on which the church is built, but only part of the foundation upon which it was built. 
The Bible tells us that, that, that he built the foundation of the church upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So a foundation needs to rest on something. All right. David uh, sees this often uh, when, uh, when, uh, when the foundation is on uh, some, 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 some bad ground, what that can lead to. And sometimes people get surprised in Alaska, especially, because you don't know necessarily what's under that ground if you don't take the time to dig. All right, so it looks good, it looks solid until, uh, until winter, and then spring, and, and you realize, wow, that door was this way when it started, or, you know, it was straight when it started, now it's over here, and yeah, what happened? It shifted. The foundation was off, and, the, and uh, uh, what it's built upon is very important. And so, you know, Ma- Jesus gave the illustration in, uh, in Matthew 7 about the wise man and the foolish man. The one built his house upon a rock, and the other built his house upon the sand. And as the kid's song goes, what happens? Right? Well, the sand, it goes, you know, it goes whoosh or whatever it was. And and the the rock, it stood firm. And so so as they're building this foundation, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of foundation is this? What is the rock upon the foundation that is laid? Many believe the rock upon which Jesus said he would build his church upon is Peter's testimony concerning Jesus. When he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Others believe that Jesus was referring to Peter as the rock that Jesus would place uh, upon the rock, which is Christ. The smaller rock upon the bigger rock, which is Christ. Of course, 1 Corinthians 10.4 talks about that rock in the wilderness was Jesus. He is the rock. But I think both arguments lead to the same conclusion that Jesus is the, the rock, the boulder, the chief cornerstone upon which the church is built. We have a foundation of the apostles and prophets, but the rock upon which it is built is the chief cornerstone. Are we okay so far? Are we following? You're belaboring this point. I'm going somewhere, I promise. So 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That makes it clear that Jesus is the only true foundation upon which a church can be built. The foundation of any structure includes the ground upon which the foundation is built. Jesus is the rock upon which that foundation is built. So the question is, how can we know whether a church rests upon the right foundation? And can we know it? So Jesus is the rock upon which the foundation of the church is laid and the chief cornerstone in that foundation. Jesus is the Word incarnate, the Word in flesh, made flesh. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1.14. The church must be built upon God's Word. The written Word of God, the Scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For doctrine, for 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 uh, uh, um, what was it for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. How, how much of Scripture is inspired of God? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. By the way, if the Bible translation you're using says something different, uh, you better check that because it, it it changes it from God being the authority to man being the authority. Some translations re- render it somewhere along something along this line. All scripture that is inspired of God is profitable. Well, then who's to determine which scripture is inspired of God and which isn't? Which leads to the modern philosophy today of textual criticism. Where it's up to man to criticize and critique the text that, that, you know, and try to figure out what belongs in there, what doesn't belong in there. And we can get ourselves in serious trouble. Because now I'm the authority. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, but the prophecy came not uh, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's the process of inspiration. The word inspiration, uh, as we get from the Scripture, it's a, it's a, it comes from two words: theo, uh, nuskos, uh, or, or uh, uh, theos is is, to, is is God. And then nuskos is uh, uh, pneumatology. That's the doctrine of the spirit. And, and, it, and it simply means a strong breath. 
God breathed out. That's inspiration. God, God, uh, you could say it this way, God uh, filled the sails of a boat to, to, to give it power, uh, the, the breath of God, if you would. God, God inspired. He moved. And so we see, in, uh, as Peter explains it, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when I say, Paul wrote this, or if I say, God wrote this, which one's correct? Both. Because Peter was moved, or Paul was moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter was moved by the Holy Ghost as he penned those words. Are we okay so far? So when we say this is the Word of God, it is in truth the very Word of God. God gave His words to man. Yeah, the Word of God is compiled of words given from God. So the church is built on the apostle and the prophets. The apostles' instruction is communicated in the New Testament. Christ's Spirit, the Spirit that inspired them to write it, and Christ is the chief cornerstone of this foundation. Therefore, the foundation of the church is proved by its submission to the authority of the words found in the Word. We all right? If a church rejects the authority of Scriptures, it is not resting on the right foundation. It is not a church that Jesus built. Some may argue that the church is built upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and not upon the Holy Scriptures, or, the whole, or not upon His Holy Spirit-inspired Scriptures. Indeed, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess the name of Christ, Romans 14.11 and Philippians 2.10. But what's interesting is, uh, I want you to see this. Why don't you turn to Psalm 138 real quick. Psalm 138. hope you don't mind turning to a few passages. I don't want you to just take some of these things as my word for it. I want you to notice something here. Now, does God say some things about His name? You better believe it. In fact, it made the list of the Big Ten if you blaspheme the name of God. Uh, we see the reverence given to the name of Christ. That, that there's, there's, there's no other name under heaven, give among men whereby we must be saved, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. The name is important. But don't you see something? Psalm 138, look at verse number 2. And I'll worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. So mark it down, everything that the Bible says about the name of God, everything, and there is a lot. We could spend all night tonight just talking about what God says about His name. He esteems His word higher. So everything that you can think about, that you can prove from Scripture about the name of God, He wants us to see His word is even higher. He's esteemed His word above His own name. That's interesting. Why is that? When we talked this morning about Christ always doing the will of the Father, always yielding himself to the Father's will. I was, uh, one of these days I'll bring a message how Christ always did everything according to the Word. Christ was in subjection to the Word. Christ fulfilled every prophecy that was said about him in his first coming. He always did what the Word said because he is the Word incarnate. Thou hast magnified thy word above thy, all thy name. See, anyone can claim his name. Matthew 7, 22 and 23, And many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. And I'll profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me that worketh iniquity. But Jesus will acknowledge those who submit to his authority, uh, the authority of his word. Mark 8, 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of, of his Father, in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. John 8, 31 through 37, Then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We know that verse, right? 
What's it connected to? Where do we find the truth? In the Word. You should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth, uh, uh, abideth ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Interesting. It was not about Jesus, it was about his word. His word. Now, there are actually people out there, I've read some articles, that are trying to make a case that if you hold too much to the word of God, you're actually committing idolatry. But as high and as lofty and as holy as God's name is, he elevates his word higher. Now, I will say this, we could worship an object, and and that'd be idolatry. I've got this holy family heirloom, this family Bible, and we bow down to it. No, no, no. It's not about the book. It's about opening up. What what does it say? Are we okay with that? But I, I promise you, you will never too highly esteem the words of God. So, the test of fellowship is not his name, it's his word. It's his word. If a church is not set up on the right foundation, you can be certain that Christ is not building it. Um, let me share with you, I, I was looking this up earlier, see if it's still on my phone. How many of you have heard of uh, this new branch of Christianity called progressive Christianity? Usually the the pastors of these progressive churches have some kind of rainbow somewhere around them. <laughs> Here's one of those statements that they make. We aren't fundamentalists. I could have told you that. We don't believe the Bible is inerrant or infallible word of God. We don't agree that creationism should replace the science of evolution in public schools. We don't believe that God hates gays. We don't believe that people of other faiths are going to hell unless they convert to Christianity. We don't deny the right of a woman to choose what happens to their bodies. Uh, By the way, it is a social religion is what it is. Um, But what's interesting is when you'll see the attacks that they have on the word of God itself. Um, And that's really where it comes down to. It's, It's an attack on the word of God. By the way, any, any person that, that carries the title pastor, any person that is, uh, by the way, a pastor is one who feeds the sheep. Anyone who takes steps into that office and tears away at people's faith in God's word. I just can't help but hear the words of the Lord. It's better for Sodom and Gomorrah. It would be better for them in that day, in the day of judgment. More tolerable. I'll tell you what, this is a, this is a high and holy thing. If, 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 if my approach, by the way, let me just say this. There are many people in seminaries today that that's exactly what they're doing. They're deteriorating and eroding people's confidence and faith in God's Word. Well, we can have faith in the God of the Word without having faith in the Word of that God. No, you can't. God is a God of His Word. God is not a man that He should lie. God will always, always hold Himself to His Word. And let me just tell you, your salvation is dependent upon it. If God can't keep His Word, how is He going to keep your soul? Are we okay? All right. I'm trying to go at a decent pace. I don't want to go too slow, but I don't want to go too fast. So, Jesus is the Word incarnate. The Word became flesh. The Word of God, the Bible, is the Word of God breathed out by His Spirit. Some would call that the Word inscripturated. We have the Word incarnate. We have the Word inscripturated. To reject the Word inscripturated is to reject the Word incarnated. You get that? To reject the Word inscripturated, God's God's revelation of Himself, would be to reject the Word incarnated. 
incarnate Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God becoming flesh. Additionally, to reject the Word of God is to reject the authority of the apostles and prophets that the church is built upon. By the way, who are the human authors of the Bible? They fall into those two categories, the apostles and prophets. So now we're, we're taking away that foundation. We chisel away, we erode the foundation of the chief cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. We start to chisel away at the foundation of the apostles and prophets that, that he laid out for us. Thus it becomes not a church that Christ is building, but a church of man. It's interesting when you look at those letters of Revelation. They're, they're very telling. We know a few things. Jesus, the churches are accountable to Jesus. He knows and tries their works. He is the one who dwells amongst uh, the candlesticks. Their ability and right to be the light for Christ. And we see each of these churches, he says, to the church at, to the church at, to the church at. And we get to the last one, to the church of the Laodiceans. Now, do we believe every word of God is pure? Do we believe that every word is inspired of God? Church at, church at, church of the Laodiceans. It's almost like God was saying, this isn't my church, it's your church, the church of the Laodiceans. By the way, the word Laodiceans means the rights of the people. Sounds a little bit like today. I've got my rights, but not him. And it's interesting, of all the churches, that's the church that says, behold, I'm standing at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Is that where Jesus belongs in a church? At the door? Where does Christ belong in a church? He needs to have the preeminence in all things. You know, it's interesting. He is the head of the church, but he's also the foundation, the chief cornerstone. He's the first. He's the last. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the Alpha, the Omega. And that is true in his church as well. You see? That's why it is so telling when you have someone like the Apostle John writing to a church, and he says, you know, guys, I wanted to come see you, but there's a character in there, probably the pastor, Diotrephus. Go look up Diotrephus sometime. He loveth to have the preeminence among them. That's a very interesting statement said about a person. When the only other time preeminence is used in the Bible is referring to Jesus Christ and his place in the church. So that means a man can usurp authority, at least for a time, in a church. And I believe at that time, it's no longer on the right foundation. They have drifted. We learn that, in, uh, uh, that, uh, that the making of this spiritual church is you and I as lively stones that are laid upon that foundation. And folks, the thing about people being lively stones is they have a hard time staying put. And we can cause that building to shift. So we need to be very careful. We need to come back and revisit these from time to time. So the questions that we got to ask yourself, how does the church uh, uh, herald the scriptures? How do, we re- how do we reverence the scriptures? How do we approach the scriptures? What is their place in our church? If the church is built upon Christ, how do we know Christ? If I were to ask you, Tell me, how do you know Christ? The right answer, you guys know, because you've been trained. We know him from his word. Can you tell me about the Lord Jesus Christ without ever referencing or mentioning anything from the word? No. The only way you could is if it's a Christ of your own making, of your own imagination. Well, I don't think that's how Christ is. Yeah, there's the key word, I don't think. (laughs) Which tells me you didn't think. (laughs) Where do we find Christ? In his word. That's where he's revealed. Tell me something about God. The only thing you can know about God apart from his word is that there is one. The Bible tells us that nature itself declares his glory and Godhead so they're without excuse. But that's as far as it goes. You're only going to know his glory and Godhead. Right? Emily mentioned tonight the northern lights. I'll tell you what, you can't look at the northern lights and just thank the majesty of our God. But that's as far as it goes. There is one. I see the order in nature. I see all this to realize, you know what? You know, it's, it's amazing to me how little actually buy into evolution, even though it's a state-funded religion. And people still aren't buying into it because it just doesn't add up. 
But you know what makes sense? I look around, I see order. There's got to be some kind of, you know, maybe it's not God, maybe it's something, but there's some kind of intelligent designer out there. That's as far as it goes when you remove the word. But God has revealed himself to us. And he's shown himself to us. By the way, what kind of God would it be if he had any expectation of his creation if he didn't tell them what he expected? What a, what a harsh God that would be. But God gave his word. And then he gave his word incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about the great lengths that God went through. God went through such, such um, far-reaching lengths to bring us the word of God. Not only through the years, through, through inspiring men, who holy men of God, as they, 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 they were inspired, they were moved to write out the word of God. And then God would use scribes and we use people to, to preserve it through the ages and, and just the supernatural preservation. By the way, the doctrine of inspiration necessitates the doctrine of preservation. What good would it be if God gave us his word if he didn't keep it for us? And I love some of the findings, like the Dead Sea Scrolls and different things in history that have just proven that, hey, God's word didn't change. We still have it, amen? Even though men have tried to destroy it, and they've tried to burn it, and they've tried to ban it, they've tried to do all these things, and God's word still has stood the test of time. As he said it would, until all be fulfilled. In fact, it goes beyond that. His word's forever settled in heaven. Amen. So he's given us his word. He's kept his word. I think about the process of God bringing us the word to English. There was a lot of bloodshed. Folks, you hold in your hands, in this old King James Bible, a very bloody book. A very bloody book. It is amazing how lightly we esteem our Bibles. When I think about, I think about Tyndale being burned at the stake. I think about some of these men who realized it was so important to get the word of God into the language of the common man. We have to be dependent upon some priest. We have to be dependent on some, some church leader to tell us what it says. Uh, everyone should have a copy. And they were hiding from the Catholic Church. And they were running for their lives. And they were doing whatever they could to try to get that job done. And to think of how many today are peddling it for profit. How many are, 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 are twisting it and, and all that. Don't give me sidetracked tonight. So if the church is built upon Christ, how do we know Christ? From the Word. So here's the big problem. If we remove the Scriptures, all we have left is a mystical view of Christ. A Christ of our imagination, a Christ of our own making. Whatever Christ means for you is your Christ. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's, that's, that's what it means to you. No, no, we saw earlier no scripture is given by any private interpretation. It's not, it's not your truth and my truth. It's, there's truth and there's error. By the way, if your truth contradicts my truth, one of us are wrong, if not both of us. Because <laughs> two opposing things can't both be true. You can't say to me, well, I think that wall is black, and I say I think that wall is right, and we, we can't walk away and say we're both right. We may walk away saying let's just agree to disagree. But we can't walk away and say we're both right. One of us is wrong. And it's probably both of us. It's probably some one of the fancy words of the, you know, all the paint colors. But anyways, but does this sound familiar? Let's tear down the walls of doctrine. They only divide. Let's just celebrate the name of Christ. That's all that matters. By the way, you want to build a big church? Let that be your motto. But here's the question, which Christ? Which Christ? Did not Jesus warn us that there will be different, multiple Christs? Which Christ? I think there are things out there, there's characters out there that people try to paint as Christ that is not Christ at all. It's very interesting what the Bible says about Satan. The Bible tells us that Satan will appear to us dressed up in red leotard and a pointed tail. And we're all going to recognize it very clearly. And what does the Bible say about the devil? How does he show up? 
an angel of light. That sounds like Jesus. That sounds like a counterfeit. Jesus is the light, right? John 1, he's the, the light that shineth on every man. John was not that light, but he spoke of that light, John 1 tells us. He bore witness to the light. Jesus is light. In fact, the Bible talks about that holy city one day, that there is no need for the sun because Christ himself is the light. So when an angel of light shows up, what's he trying to do? He's trying to trick you. He's trying to be, uh, he is the, the counterfeit that he is. So how can you discern it? How can you know? How can you try the spirit to see if it's of God? We come back to the word incarnate is going to be in conjunction with the word in scripture. Which Christ? So we have a test on how we can uh, how, um, on how we have evaluated Scripture. We have another test. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, we're, we're going to get more and more narrow here. We're going to get more narrow as we funnel this thing down. Uh, There's a little simple statement I learned a while back from a, a title of a book. All right, get ready to have your mind blown. This is going to be the most profound statement you've ever heard. Did you know that things that are different are not the same? That's a, tell you what, if we can get a hold of that truth, how that would revolutionize our schools. Things that are different are not the same. You say 2 plus 2 is 4, you say 2 plus 2 is 5. Those aren't the same. One's wrong. Things that are different are not the same. Did you know not all, not all Bibles are created equal? See, this gets down to some, some interesting territory. I grew up in church. I didn't even know there was an issue. I didn't even know there was a debate, a discussion. I figured it was all just about a preference issue. All Bibles are about the same, right? My grandfather was a Bible translator, and he had rejected the King James Bible. He, uh, he um, had a lot of education. I think he had a lot of pride mixed in there. But he rejected the King James Bible. And, and in fact, he actually wrote his own version of the book of Romans that took a college degree just to read the thing. It was so complex, as if Romans is not difficult enough. <laughs> I mean, he complicated that thing. Interesting. You know, with each new Bible version that comes out, it's almost like we water it down a little bit. A little bit. How don't you notice some of these diminishing things over some verses? Let me just share with you one verse, okay? Romans 14, 23, the King James Bible reads, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's some strong language, would you agree? The ESV. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because he eateth not of because uh, he eats he is eating not in faith. For whatsoever is not, not proceeded from faith is sin. It's hard to read a different translation. We've got to memorize another one. <laughs> so we see he that doubteth is damned, but he that doubts is condemned. The New Living Translation. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you're not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. So, damned, condemned, sinning, the message. By the way, don't read the Bible. Or don't read the message, read the Bible. If you're not sure, if you notice that you are acting in ways inconsistent with what you believe, some days trying to impose your opinions on others, other days just trying to please them, then you know that you are out of line. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. Doesn't that sound nice? By the way, there's a lot more words in there than the Greek had. <laughs> so, damned, condemned, sinning, you're probably wrong. Those are all the same verse, by the way, supposedly. Most believers who consider themselves conservative Bible-believing Christians would agree with the following statement. A true church must be built upon the teachings of God's holy word, given by inspiration of God and found in the Bible. But did you know that most churches today use Bible versions that ascribe Satan the title that belongs exclusively to Jesus? By the way, would you agree that the Word of God is a part of our spiritual armor, part of our spiritual weaponry. 
Do you believe that there is a spiritual battle? What a great thing if I can sell you a counterfeit weapon. In fact, if I was in a war and I was providing the weapons, by the way, I'll be willing to a lot of money doing that. What, 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 would, what, what could I accomplish if I sold defective weapons to my enemy and still profit? That'd be a pretty good ploy, wouldn't it? Jesus, when he was tempted in the desert by the devil, he responded with this. Men shall not live by bread alone. Well, then what? Did you know some translations, that's all it says? King James Bible renders it, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Would you agree that the Bible translation issue is a spiritual warfare issue? When, um, when the, the, the man who had a son who, uh, um, who was a lunatic came to the disciples and they couldn't cast him out, and they came to Jesus, and Jesus casted out the devil out of the boy. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, the disciples came to Jesus later, and he says, Lord, how come we couldn't cast him out? He gave them power over, over the unclean spirits. How come we couldn't cast him out? Here's what Jesus said to them, really interesting. You only find in the King James Bible. This kind cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. The other translations say this kind comes out only by prayer. Well, I'm sure the disciples prayed. There are some spiritual war battles that we will enter into that require the next level of fasting. What if the devil takes that away from us? I think we've lost a little bit of power in spiritual warfare. I'm getting sidetracked there, but I'm saying is, is tampering with the Word of God is tampering with our weaponry in this spiritual war. So I want you to see something. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. There are a lot of examples we can get into. I just want to share with you just a couple tonight. Um, because if, if the Bible is intricately connected to the fact of having a right foundation, if it is, if it is imperative, that, uh, uh, an inseparable part of that right foundation, then we have to ask ourselves, do we have the right thing? Do we have the right, you know, it's kind of like, you know, there are certain types of mixtures in cement or concrete. If you're laying a foundation, you can do that wrong. Do you know that? You can have the right or the wrong mixture in that foundation, and that house will crumble. That's why it's good to have experts sometimes. If you don't know what you're doing, just hire somebody. You see? Uh, we've seen a lot of people that try to make it work, myself included. And then later you end up having to do it again and spend more than, you know, trying to save a penny, you spend a dollar. Isaiah 14, the Bible says this about the devil. By the way, the only place you're going to find, uh, but the only place, let me back up. Does anybody know the devil's name? Lucifer. Most, even non-Christians know the devil's name. Do you know where you find it? Close. Close. The only place the word Lucifer shows up is in the King James Bible. And yet everybody knows the devil's name. It's found here in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And he goes through this whole thing about him being lifted up with pride and so forth. But he calls him Lucifer, son of the morning. Did you know other translations will use the name day star, morning star, star of the morning, which are all titles exclusively given to the Lord Jesus Christ? The NIV calls him morning star. In the NIV, you can go over to Revelation where Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. It's almost like the devil left a few little fingerprints here and there. I wonder if they'll catch this. I wonder if they'll see this. You know, things like, let's remove virgin and just change it with young woman. Behold, a young woman will conceive and bear a son. Oh, that's, an, that's a miracle. It's not a miracle. But a virgin, that's only happened once. 2 Peter 1.19, uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well to, that, uh, that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Who's the day star? We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're confused if that's ascribed to Satan. Revelation 22.16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel. Who's talking? I, Jesus, 
have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So let me ask you, is there justification for calling Lucifer the morning star? The Hebrew word that's translated as Lucifer is found only once in Scripture, and it's not found anywhere outside of the Hebrew Scriptures. It is a proper noun made from a Hebrew word, which means howl, to howl. You know, like, oh, to howl. It is pronounced halel. It sometimes it, are, uh, it sounds similar to another Hebrew word, halel, meaning praise. Some think their similarity in these words references Satan's former and latter positions, but it's really it's mere conjecture. We know that Satan was at one time made for the praise of God. We, if you want to learn a little more about the devil, go to Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15. We're not going to go there right now, but uh, you'll get a little insight on what Satan was made for. Us. He was a beautiful creature. He had instruments built into him. But because pride, he was cast down and became the howling or yelling one. In, in Isaiah here, we, uh, he has given this unique name. He is seen howling against God in anguish and his anger and shame. It's a fitting name for Satan. Were the, tra were the translators correct in using Lucifer as they tra translated Hillel? They recognized that the word uh, was coined from the Hebrew verb to howl, creating a unique proper name for Satan. The English proper name for Satan then is common use, use was Lucifer. It suits the howling devil who transforms himself into an angel of light. I believe all the meaning that God breathed into the word Hillel is uh, expressed in the word Lucifer. The Hebrew word translated Lucifer comes entirely from an assumption about the Latin word, which some say signifies shining. This is the basis for including the word star in many of the newer translations. The problem with the theory is there is nothing to support it. There is nothing in Isaiah 14 that re refers to a star. The reference to Satan as son of the morning acknowledges only that he was among the sons of God that shouted at the dawn of creation in Job 38.7. In fact, remember earlier parts of Job, the day when all the sons of God came to give an account and Satan also came? He was included in that. But there's no justification for morning star anywhere in Isaiah 14. So nothing can just, uh, justify ascribing to Satan, God's enemy, a title the Bible gives exclusively to Jesus, God's son. So how did such an error occur? And why do so many seemingly good Christian people accept these versions? The simple answer is found in Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I was in church my entire life, and it wasn't until I was 19 years old that I was even, I was even addressed that there's, there's an issue. I always thought, well, aren't they just translating it from one language to another? Then I realized, wait a minute, there's whole groups of manuscripts in the other languages. Some corrupted, some preserved. The Bible warns that some would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in 1 Timothy 4.1. We are commanded to not, not to believe every spirit, but to try the spirits to seek the of God, 1 John 4, 1 and 2. By the way, one of the, one of the notions of the charismatic movement is you never question the spirit. Always do wherever the Spirit leads, you always do it. But the Bible tells us to try the Spirit, see if they're of God. By the way, isn't one of the fruits of the Spirit temperance? Let this sink in for a minute. Because the charismatics will have you believe that if you're overcome by the Spirit, you're going to be flopping around on the ground, you're going to be speaking in uncontrollably in other tongues. Uh, there's almost no end to some of the chaos that, that, that takes place. But what's consistent with all of it is you lose control. But if the Spirit's moving... You're in control. Temperance. Just a thought. That one was free. So what spirit do you suppose gives to Satan the title that belongs exclusively to Jesus Christ? What spirit do you think that is of? By the way, think about that. Is there any relation to Jesus and Satan? The Mormons will tell you they're brothers. Jehovah's Witness says that Christ is a created being. Is he or is he God? You see how we can start to chisel away at this thing? If Christ is the foundation, we have to understand which Christ, what is that foundation? The Word of God is the foundation for the church. 
Jesus, the Word of God incarnate, builds His church upon the Scriptures, uh, the words of the Word inscripturated. Many Christians proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, but they have adopted uh, Bible versions and positions on the Bible that are of another spirit. They might desire to be authentic, uh, an authentic Christian church, and they might desire to do the right thing, but they might have an unstable foundation. Now, I just want to say this. I'm not angry at anybody who uses another translation. I'm not against anybody who uses other translations. But I do think that is a topic that is very, it's very important that we investigate it. It is very worthwhile to look into this issue because we're dealing with the very Word of God that He esteems higher than His own name. That's important. And we take it very flippantly. I remember I was a teenager when I first came across somebody who said, I use the King James Bible because, uh, because I believe it's more accurate. That was the first time I ever heard that thing. I was like, King James Bible, isn't that like Shakespeare and stuff? And I, I didn't investigate it, but it always like, stored in the back of my mind. I was like, that's interesting, more accurate. I never even thought about the issue of accuracy. By the way, people say this, oh, I, would, I would read the King James Bible, but it's just it's so hard to read. Let me ask you, which is more important, accuracy or readability? Accuracy. You can always increase your understanding, but if you have something that is more readable but less accurate, you can never increase the accuracy. What you have is what you have. Does that make sense? So one common theme with the church that does not clarify their stance on the Word of God is whether by word or by action, they begin to diminish it. They'll use less and less scripture in their sermons. Uh, since everyone has a little bit of a different version, uh, they even go to the extreme of not using a Bible at all. Um, or here's what you'll see a lot. They'll bounce around from versions to try to prove their point. Uh, I always get a kick out of that one. And I'll be, I'll be familiar with one of those verses. I'm like, that's not what that verse says. That's not the context. That's not... What you'll find is with most churches, they've adopted one of these corrupt translations, and they'll manifest most of the characteristics of this new cart church that we're going to look you more into as we unpack, uh, and we're going to start taking some top, topic by topic as we consider the old paths and what that looks like to this new cart. Um, but once, let me just tell you this, once the Word of God goes, all is fair game. Because we've now abandoned the authority upon which this church stands. I've often said this, if I, if I didn't have such a strong reverence for the Word of God, I don't know what I'd preach. Because I don't have enough exciting stories to keep everybody busy. I just got to teach the Word, preach the Word. And folks, that is our desire. We're, we want this to be a part of the DNA of our church to really understand that, that we need to have a sure foundation. And you can build upon a wrong foundation and still call yourself a church. Did you know not everything that has, says church on a sign is, is, a, is, is the Lord's church? Did you know not everything that says the word B-I-B-L-E on it is the word of God? I know that's not popular. I know it's narrow. I know the majority of the pastors, even in this very community, don't use this book. But folks, I can't even, I can't violate my own conscience. I know too much. When you've studied, you've learned it, you know, there are times I've wanted to compromise on some of these things because it just would be more acceptable. We could build the church faster. But once you've seen the evidence, you've weighed out the evidence, you do realize things that are different cannot possibly be the same. God gave us His Word, and He's preserved His Word, and He hasn't changed His Word. And, and the character of God Himself, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If that's the character of God, the Word incarnate, then the Word inscripturated ought to be the same as well. Don't mess with God's Word. Don't mess with it. Let me, let me close with this. Let me give you this warning for those who have messed with the Word. As God is closing out the Bible shutting that canon of Scripture and saying, we're done, there's no new books, God has completed His revelation to man. 
one of the last passages, one of the last verses in your Bible says this. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He that testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The very last thing God gives us before he closes out the Bible is don't mess with my words. I don't know what all that curse entails, but let me just say it's not good. Don't mess with God's word. (coughs) If you want to have a sure foundation, we are to take God's word by faith. We are to read it faithfully, apply it faithfully, and walk in light of it faithfully. God will always lead you in light of his word, as well as his churches. Amen. Appreciate your patience this evening. I hope that was a blessing to you. And we'll continue the, the series next week.